We are steaming south in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Africa. In the past half year, we have studied the creatures of the coral reef. We observed the life cycle of the giant turtles and we ventured into the disquieting realm of the shark. Now we seek the largest animal that ever existed, the whale. To find whales, sonar devices are still impractical. The only reliable means is the lookout scanning the horizon for telltale spouts. When whales reach the surface, they exhale, sending 50-foot vapor plumes into the air. The deeper they dive, the higher whales spout when they return. And it's the spout which has always betrayed them to the hunter. We know from the size and the characteristic hook-shaped dorsal fin that this is a finback whale. We must react quickly, for the finback stays only a minute or two at the surface. Then it will dive and be lost for as much as 20 minutes. Traveling alone or in groups of two or three, the daily routine of a finback is unknown. To study its behavior, we have improvised an unusual tracking method that will allow us to remain in contact with the whale. Chief diver Albert Falco becomes Queequeg, the harpooner of Moby Dick. The shaft is long enough to give balance for throwing, but the barb is designed only to hook into the thick blubber, not to injure or kill. Boys attached to the harpoon by 1500 feet of line will reveal the location of the whale while it pursues its secret life a thousand feet below the surface. The thin line proves too fragile against the pull of the 20-ton finback. Harpoon the fin back again. The speedy zodiac must be used. In the cramped rubber boat, Falco will rely on the rifle harpoon to set the second line. Whoa. 
This is an historic moment. For the very first time, the finback whale is seen and filmed underwater in the open sea. From our boat on the surface, the size and power of the finback frightens us. Suddenly, underwater, our fear changes to awe. Nothing has prepared us for the sight of such enormity moving with such grace. The tail of a finback measures 12 feet across and generates 200 horsepower. It is also the only defensive weapon he can use against predators, the shark, the killer whale, and even man. We are both mammals, man and the finback. Much of our body physiology operates in the same way. But in his adaptation to the sea, the whale has undergone critical changes. He is free in the three-dimensional world of the sea, and we are not. So it is with a sense of envy that we watch the finback return to the deep. In our search for the whales, Falco and I travel back in time and into the romance and legend of the great beast. We are steeped in that atmosphere at Mystic Seaport in Connecticut, the restored whaling village. Here rests the last surviving wooden whaling ship, the Charles W. Morgan, which made her final voyage in 1921. The men who sailed her helped create the myth of the whale and the terrifying tales they brought back from the sea. In the words of Starbuck, chief mate of Captain Ahab's ship, I will have no man in my boat who does not fear a whale. They sought the sperm whale, rich in oil, big, fast, and strong. Once spotted, the longboats would give chase. Often they would track the whale for hours. Six men in a boat 28 feet long, pursuing a whale weighing 40 tons and measuring 50 feet or more. When the longboat gets close enough to the whale, the harpooner harpoons the animal, and the harpoon is attached to the boat by a long rope.
later on, the whale is killed with a lance. And this weapon is held and stuck into the lungs of the animal several times until it dies. The dead whale was towed to the boat and attached alongside and men with his tools began cutting in like this, yes, in order to detach large pieces of blubber. This was a very exhausting work. The head of the sperm whale contained a very special treasure, several bowls of pure oil. It is here in this part that a large, beautiful mammal ended up. Crewmen boiled its blubber into oil with a screwed tube. And uh, of course, I imagine that with rolling and pitching, this uh, oil must have spilled all over the deck and uh, that the smell must have been absolutely awful. Uh, it took about three days of hard work to take care of the grease and oil of one single whale. With such primitive equipment, the total catch per year was about 8,000 whales. Tragically, whalers today take 10 times that total. At the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, a life-size model provides a unique opportunity for studying the anatomy of a whale. Here, frozen for eternity in paint and plastic, it hints at its awesome secrets. Yes, Fabian, it's uh, the largest animal that ever lived, a blue whale. Uh, this model represents a blue whale, 92 feet long and weighing probably 135 tons. Whales actually were uh, probably land mammals about 30 million years ago. And uh, they have adapted in a beautiful way to the aquatic environment. His eyes, for example, are relatively small and his vision poor, but his hearing is very accurate. His forelegs became flippers, and as his body streamlined, his hind legs disappeared. Now his powerful tail takes up a full one-third of his length. This creature lives mainly on tiny shrimps, opening a wide mouth and inflating his elastic frills. He takes in tons of water, then pushes it out through these strainers of whalebone, which retain the shrimp. There are over 50 varieties of whales. Most of the large ones, the baleen whales, have uh, whale bones instead of teeth. The sperm whales and the killer whales on the contrary have powerful teeth. They could, if they ever wished to do so, attack and even eat a man. The huge dorsal fin marks the male killer whale. The largest male is the leader of a family group that lives and hunts the sea together. Killer whales have been captured alive. To study one at close range, Falco travels to Marine World in California, where he meets director Brad Baru and a 20-foot female killer whale named Clyde. We brought the two females down from Canada, and uh, all the way down, they communicated with a very high, shrill sound, back and forth. 
The killer whale is known to attack dolphins and seals, and it appears at sea as if all creatures scurry from their path. Yet in the rare encounters of divers with the killer whale, he has always seemed to be only curious and friendly. Wonderful animals. They seem to be very intelligent. They adapt, seem to be adapting faster than the porpoises at this time. They respond to the sound. Yeah. It's temperamental. She has a mind of her own. It has been reported that when one killer whale is captured, the others stay nearby and keep up a dramatic conversation. This sound has been recorded, and we play it back in the tank to observe Clyde's reaction. At first, Clyde answers the cries. Clyde is still too new to captivity to trust completely. Falco enters the tank gingerly, unsure himself in a sea only 40 feet across. When the sound is switched off, Clyde turns away. Back in contact, Clyde swims toward the speaker. Hearing plays a primary role in a whale's perception for echolocation as well as communication. Whales are equipped with veritable sonar detectors. They receive signals not only through their tiny ears, but also through their entire skull structure, and perhaps along their bodies as well. Interrupted again in mid-conversation, Clyde scans the tank for her newfound, new lost friend. One day, we may be able to understand this squeaky language, but for the moment, it's enough to know they speak and understand. The dog hunts with his nose, man with his eyes, the killer whale uses sound. The facility has developed because he lives in a world of limited visibility, where smell does not carry, but where sounds travel great distances. Not enough is known about whales yet to determine what role their clicks and grunts play in hunting. But Clyde, on the way to a snack, is deterred by a thin board she could crunch into sawdust. Only a form of sonar could have directed her lunges and retreats. Falco thinks the high-pitched sound of a small motorboat interferes in some way with the communications apparatus of whales, like jamming a radio signal. Falco's experiment works almost too well. The scream of the motor sends Clyde into a fury of confusion. May 20th, near the Maldive Islands. Floating on the surface, we have discovered a piece of giant squid, a deep living creature. The squid is common game for the sperm whale. The backs of the whales are often scarred by the horny beaks of the squid and by the suction cups of its tentacles. What we have found is the debris of battle. This section measures two feet and we estimate the squid must have been about eight feet long. 
Now we know the sperm cannot be far off. Minute drifting plants begin the chain of marine life. Small creatures feed on this watery meadow. They are prey for larger creatures who in turn become a part of the food chain that reaches the largest squid at 3,000 feet. It is to feed on squid that the sperm whale developed his remarkable capacity for deep dives. The search is underway for sperm whales in the area where the piece of squid was discovered. Falco tries to select a harpoon that will just pierce the thin skin and hold fast in the blubber. If a whale is cut deeply enough to penetrate his protective layer of blubber, he will eventually bleed to death. The monarch of the deep suffers the legendary infirmity of European royalty, hemophilia. For Falco, it's a delicate choice, but it marks the difference between science and slaughter. This time it's Dumas who raises the first whale. By the angle of its spout blowing from the left, he knows it's a sperm. Elle souffle! Droit devant! Elle oblique sur la gauche! Of all the whales of the sea, the spermaceti whale has most captured the imagination of sailors and landlubbers alike. Herman Melville's Moby Dick was a sperm, as were all the savage whales of fiction. Their huge foreheads give them a majestic and fearful appearance. They have been said to ram ships with this forehead, battering at them until their hulls cave in. To find a whale is tricky. To keep track of him is even more difficult. And the maddest challenge of all is in our desire to film the whale underwater. First, we must attach our marker buoys to the whale so that we may follow him wherever he goes. A mounted knight stir up to the zodiac. Falco enters the field. The very sound of the speeding zodiac seems to complicate the problem of tagging the whale. The sperm veers away from the noise of the boat, and only the zodiac's speed allows Falco to catch up with his target. The first step is accomplished. Our bouchon de champagne, our champagne cork, follows behind the whale, securely attached to his back. For night tracking, a suitable target for Calypso's radar is needed. Aluminum foil supplies partial solution. It'll be hung in the sky above the whale. The finishing touch is a kite tune, part kite, part balloon. Trailing a 75-foot aluminum foil tail, It'll be attached to the buoy, attached to the whale. To study the unknown, untried tools must be used. Ben Franklin flew a kite in a thunderstorm, and its dangling key unlocked the wonders of electricity. The men of Calypso are explorers, and where no man has ventured before, there's no man to tell them how. Others came to the sea to kill Leviathan, plunder his riches chase him to the brink of extinction. Now the task is to save him. But we cannot put this beast under a microscope or fashion an aquarium that will hold him. So we must grope for methods and construct crude pieces of apparatus to help. Aboard the Calypso, improvisation of equipment has become an art. The sperm whale migrates at the surface, 
but feeds in the depths. 2,800 feet of line stretch from the whale to the kaitoon to allow for his dive. In a characteristic gesture, the tail fluke points skyward and the sperm whale sounds. The whale's descent is vertical, carrying with him line, buoy, and finally snapping the cord of the buoyant kaitoon. For the first time, it has been proven that the whale travels more than a half mile down in his search for food. May 20th, 5 p.m., an hour after losing the kaitoon, the rest of the whale herd surfaces. Whalers believe that sperms, like other toothed whales, travel in groups, usually one male and a herd of females. When a young male challenges the bull of a family group and wins, he takes over the harem, and the defeated bull goes off to roam the seas alone and find a solitary death. Old whalers call them emperors. For the moment, the quiet throb of Calypso's engines does not disturb the whales. Trailing the herd allows a unique opportunity for filming them from the undersea observation chamber in the bow. Attention, phoné. Alors attention, on tourne, hein? Attention, fenêtre, attention, fenêtre. Moving slower than the herd, a mother and a newborn calf loom before Calypso on a collision course. The propellers must be stopped to avert possible injury to the baby. The baby whale, born tail first, must immediately be pushed to the surface to breathe, or he'll drown. One third the size of the mother at birth, about 14 feet long. He drinks half a ton of milk a day, squirted from nipples that are hidden inside slits in the mother's belly. He will be full grown in 10 years, can live to 30. This is where Calypso lost the large sperm whale and the kaitoon. Two miles further west is the pack. 11 sperm whales. And now we went northeast and met a mother and baby. And we must try to attach a marker to the baby. Baby whales do not dive deeply. We often see them waiting at the surface for the mothers to return from feeding. Only when they grow and strengthen will they be taught to sound. The noise of the zodiac frightens the baby. As the boat cuts in front of him, he hesitates, and Falco is able to place his short bow. We have isolated the baby not to harm it, but to study the reactions of the baby and mother and the herd. Because we feel uneasy about what we have done, we hurry to check the condition of the young whale.
The baby has tangled the lion around his tail, but appears to be unhurt. Secured like a lasso, the rope should hold. So begins an unprecedented investigation into the social behavior of the sperm. now a little further north and we have been successful attaching a kaitun to the baby. The pack is still around. The Calypso raises signals to warn other ships that she is on track and not free to veer from her course. We are sure that mammals of the sea communicate with one another. Through the use of modulated sounds, they convey complex messages. It is likely that even the baby whale will be capable of calling for help. Calypso's sound engineer, Marcelin, positions the launch between the baby and the disappearing herd. The hydrophone records two sounds. The constant clicking is the sonar beeps of the baby. The growl is his voice, his cry perhaps. The bubbling aqualung has often blurred the sounds Falco hears while diving. For the first time, he can hear the whale clearly. May 20th, 5.30 p.m. A rotating watch checks the movements of the whales. Whatever course the herd takes, the baby follows. By late afternoon, it appears as though other whales have joined the group. Perhaps some sense of community danger has drawn them, for the sperm whales are like a marching nation, moving inexorably from one pole of their migratory trek to the other. The buoy holds. The kaitun drifts behind. And as Calypso tracks the baby, crewmen, without realizing it, look up from their work periodically to check the progress of the infant sperm. The experience today has given me the basis of an intriguing theory. Apparently, in the oil-filled head of the creature lies the key to its success. The monstrous head appears to be an ultra-directional transducer of sound. This extraordinary sensitivity enables him to hunt in the darkness of the deep.
From evening sun to dawn, the radar will stand watch over the youngster and the bridal train of Bowie and Kaitun. In a very few hours, he has come to be more than simply the subject of an important study. Through this night, at one point in every conversation, a question is asked. Est-ce qu'il est encore là? Is it still there? radar bouncing signals on the aluminum foil tail of the Kaitun has kept Calypso within five miles of the baby through the night. The first entry in the logbook of Calypso for May 21st reads, Oui, il est là. Yes, it is still there. There is still two hours until there'll be enough daylight to film the young whale. constant chatter of the baby and the answers of the herd have reverberated through the sea. The morning lookouts report there are spouts on the horizon for 360 degrees around the ship. A few of the larger whales begin dropping back from the herd and the intensity of the baby's cries increases. Old whalers claim to have seen one whale rescue another by pulling the harpoon free with their teeth. The mother cradles the baby in the way of whales, chattering her special sounds. It bends the imagination to consider that her sounds are instructions. There can only be conjecture as to what actually occurred below the surface. The harpoon now raises new questions. Was it jarred loose or actually pulled out by the mother? Dumas, here's the situation. The first baby sperm whale was stopped here by the infernal circle. Three adults came from the pack and liberated the kid at 11.20. Falco orders the boats to search for the baby. The baby, confused and frightened, ceases movement. Falco prepares the marking tag while a new tracking buoy is attached to the baby. In years to come, the tag may provide an invaluable record of whale behavior and movement.
He's only a baby, yet he's ten times the weight of a man. Because he lives in a realm of boundless food, he will grow to as much as 50 feet and weigh over 50 tons. In this manner, the entire species has thrived amid the plenty of the sea. In all likelihood, they will continue to grow larger and still larger for ages to come. Tagging done, I asked the divers to cut the baby loose. We dare not tamper longer with this marvelous child. He has served briefly to increase our knowledge, to excite our imagination in a way that few creatures have ever done. And now he must return to the mother, the herd, and to the nation that prowls the sea. Bonne chance. In the first years of the Calypso's travels, eager to explore the sea's unrevealed secrets, we searched all sorts of wrecks and plunged into lakes, rivers, and submerged caverns using diving gear and mini sub. We made friends with a wide variety of creatures, but always felt a special kinship to the aquatic mammals like dolphins, seals, and sea lions. Our amazement has never ebbed, and today we are as curious as ever to continue rediscovering the world with our new friends. or two at the surface. Then it will dive and be lost for as much as 20 minutes. Traveling alone or in groups of two or three, the daily routine of a finback is unknown. To study its behavior, we have improvised an unusual tracking method that will allow us to remain in contact with the whale. Chief diver Albert Falco becomes Queequeg, the harpooner of Moby Dick. The shaft is long enough to give balance for throwing, but the barb is designed only to hook into the thick blubber, not to injure or kill. Boys 
batteries attached to the harpoon by 1,500 feet of line will reveal the location of the whale while it pursues its secret life a thousand feet below the surface. The thin line proves too fragile against the... We are steaming south in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Africa. In the past half year, we have studied the creatures of the coral reef. We observed the life cycle of the giant turtles, and we ventured into the disquieting realm of the shark. Now we seek the largest animal that ever existed, the whale. To find whales, sonar devices are still impractical. The only reliable means is the lookout scanning the horizon for telltale spouts. When whales reach the surface, they exhale, sending 50-foot vapor plumes into the air. The deeper they dive, the higher whales spout when they return. And it's the spout which has always betrayed them to the hunter. We know from the size and the characteristic hook-shaped dorsal fin that this is a finback whale. We must react quickly, for the finback stays only a minute. This is an historic moment. For the very first time, the finback whale is seen and filmed underwater in the open sea. From our boat on the surface, the size and power of the finback frightens us. Suddenly, underwater, our fear changes to awe. Nothing has prepared us for the sight of such enormity moving with such grace. The tail of a finback measures 12 feet across and generates 200 horsepower. It is also the only defensive weapon he can use against predators, the shark, the killer whale, and even man. Pull of the 20-ton finback. To harpoon the fin back again, the speedy Zodiac must be used.
in the cramped rubber boat, Falco will rely on the rifle harpoon to set the second line. We are both mammals, man and a finback. Much of our body physiology operates in the same way. But in his adaptation to the sea, the whale has undergone critical changes. He is free in the three-dimensional world of the sea, and we are not. So it is with a sense of envy that we watch the finback return to the deep. In our search for the whales, Falco and I travel back in time and into the romance and legend of the great beast. We are steeped in that atmosphere at Mystic Seaport in Connecticut, a restored whaling village. Here rests the last surviving wooden whaling ship, the Charles W. Morgan, which made her final voyage in 1921. The men who sailed her helped create the myth of the whale and the terrifying tales they brought back from the sea. In the words of Starbuck, chief mate of Captain Ahab's ship, I will have no man in my boat who does not fear a whale. They sought the sperm whale, rich in oil, big, fast, and strong. Once spotted, the longboats would give chase. Often they would track the whale for hours. Six men, in a boat 28 feet long, pursuing a whale weighing 40 tons, and measuring 50 feet or more. Mm -hmm. 